and welcome back to our last video in our video series about DNA. This one's on gene control. Now before you watch this one, it's a really good idea that you've watched the previous videos, structure of DNA, DNA replication, the introduction to protein synthesis, and both the transcription and translation videos. If you've done that, then you're ready for gene control. Now, gene control is a tough topic. Uh, it's not something that's really easy to teach, and, and what this is going to be is a fairly cursory overview of gene control. Bear that in mind and, and have your note packet out while we're going through this. So let's start with the nature of gene control and eukaryotes. During sexual reproduction, gametes fuse during fertilization to make a zygote. So we all start as a single cell. And over time, that one cell develops through mitosis and cell division into a ball of cells. And every one of these cells has the exact same genetic content. And eventually, this ball of cells, and all these cells are relatively the same, could become one of these guys. So the question is, if all these cells have the same DNA, do they have the same structure and function? Well, let's take a look at these two types of cells. Over here we have neurons, cells of the nervous system, and over here we have very distinctly different looking cells from the pancreas. And the cells of the pancreas are going to produce many different types of digestive enzymes and two hormones, insulin and glucagon, that help regulate blood sugar. And neurons are going to produce neurotransmitters and send signals via electrical impulses. So it's obvious that we have a wide variety of cells that are distinctly structurally and functionally different. And the process by which that ball of cells turns into these distinctly different cells is called cell differentiation. But what about moment to moment differences? Let's just look at these pancreas cells. Can cells adjust the amount and type of products they're producing from moment to moment? Do pancreatic cells always produce the same amount of the same digestive enzymes or, or hormones? It turns out that individual cells and groups of cells can adjust their cellular output based on environmental conditions, internal factors, and external signals. The basis for both the cellular differentiation and the dynamics of cellular protein production is gene control. While every cell in our body is exactly the same in genetic content, they're not identical in their gene expression. Which genes are being expressed depends on the type of cell, those moment-to-moment -moment adjustments based on signals from the outside, and there are going to be a lot of regulatory proteins that we're going to talk about as we go through this that are going to enhance or suppress both transcription and translation, being influenced by things like hormones and concentrations of other chemicals. And these subtle interactions, both positive and negative, control and help us maintain a balance uh, or a homeostasis in the cells. A good analogy to kind of represent both these differences in types of cells and also differences in moment-to-moment -moment output is something like saying that here we have two very different types of factories. Maybe this one makes office furniture and this one makes automobiles. Uh, and then if this one does make office furniture, then uh, it may adjust its output based on what orders are placed in terms of one day maybe you get an order for a large number of desks and the next day you get an order for a large number of um, copy machines or something. The point is these are dynamic systems that can change. So basically we've said we have two levels of gene control. One that results in cells being very different types of cells and one focused on the moment to moment adjustments. Let's focus on this cell differentiation first. Recall from our discussion on the structure of DNA, at the end of that video we talked about the DNA molecule being concentrated and wrapped around these proteins what we call histones and into these larger structures that we call chromosomes. And if you can think about this molecule being wrapped up around these other molecules and those tightly wound, it can make it obvious to see that uh, it might be difficult for RNA polymerase to get to the gene uh, in order for transcription to occur some of the genes may not even be available for transcription. The point is, not every part of the genome is available for transcription and therefore available to be expressed. Think about it like this. It's kind of like a filing cabinet and all of our genes reside in these different drawers and not every drawer is available to be open. One specific type of this, what I call DNA packing, is called DNA methylation. When methyl groups are added to DNA bases, it makes genes inactive or unavailable for transcription. And what's interesting is, uh, once these genes get packed away, in other words, once these drawers get locked down, that any cells that, were, that um, 
come from this cell that has this pattern of methylation will have the same pattern. So if this filing cabinet were to reproduce and make these two filing cabinets, they would already be um, in the same pattern of which drawers are locked and which ones are open and available. So these genes are not accessible and the genes in the open drawers would be. So this methylated DNA or DNA that's unavailable for transcription. And once we have a pattern of uh, methylation, where am I going to hear? Once we have differentiated, a cell can give rise to only cells with the same type, uh, a same pattern of methylated DNA. For example, a liver cell can only give rise to a liver cell. Another example of this chemical modification of the DNA is histone acetylation. Attachment of histones, or I'm sorry, of acetyl groups to the histones changes the shape of the histones so that they hold the DNA less tightly. In this case, opening up the DNA or unpacking it, making the genes more accessible to RNA polymerase, therefore available for transcription. The DNA methylation and histone acetylation have opposite uh, roles. So here's a diagram that kind of summarizes. These top genes would be switched on. They'd be available for transcription because we have unmethylated uh, DNA and acetylated histones, whereas genes that are turned off or sections of DNA that are closed down or packed away would have methylated DNA and deacetylated histones. What results is a unique pattern of available and unavailable genes in groups of differentiated cells. While each cell contains the whole genome, they don't express every gene, so we get different types of cells. Now let's consider the other side of gene control the moment-to-moment -moment adjustments to modify cellular production. Cellular production is influenced by the environment. Both internal and external signals affect which proteins are made, as well as which version of that protein, and the quantity produced. Each cell factory to a dynamic system that's adjusting its output to meet the needs of the cell or the, or the organism to maintain homeostasis. We're going to focus on the process of protein synthesis and look at where in this process we can exert that gene control. So assuming that the DNA is unpacked and available for transcription, there's five possible places within the system where we can make adjustments to the final product. We can affect the system at transcription, after transcription but before leaving the nucleus, after leaving the nucleus but before arriving at the ribosome, at translation or at the ribosome, and then post-protein production, we still have one more chance to modify those proteins. So let's look at these five different spots in this process where we can exert control. Let's start with transcriptional control. It turns out that the majority of our gene control occurs at the DNA or in the nucleus at transcription where different proteins that either help or hinder RNA polymerase to binding to the promoter region. So we've seen this diagram, these clusters of proteins that are aiding this molecule, RNA polymerase, to bind to the DNA to engage in, prote uh, to engage in um, transcription or RNA synthesis. Now let's move to the next place in the process where we can exert gene control. Let's look here in the middle where after we've made the messenger RNA, we process it or we edit it down. This RNA processing, or I'm going to call it differential editing, after we've made our pre-mRNA, we had the step where we edited it down, we remember that from our transcription discussion, and we cut out the introns and spliced together the exons. But different signals can cause us to do this process differently. So here's what we saw in our other video, where we cut out the introns, splice together the exons, and make our mature messenger RNA strand. But what if we did it different? What if we moved that one down, bring in the original again, the pre-mRNA, but this time we edit differently, and we leave in this intron when we splice together the resulting or the leftover parts, we have a different version of this messenger RNA that can go to the ribosome. So from one primary transcript, we have two different mature messenger RNAs that might leave the nucleus. So let's move to the next place that we can have an effect. After we've edited our messenger RNA, it leaves the nucleus to go to the ribosome. But we can exert control here, we call it an RNA transport control, but the mature RNA leaves the nucleus and sometimes it's not used right away, it can be stored. And another example of this control or at, at this stage that we talked about before is the length of poly A tail. In our transcription video we talked about the importance of adding this long poly A tail to the transcript that played a role in the lifespan of that transcript. 
the longer the polyatale, tail, the longer the transcripts are round. So that's another example of control of gene expression, because if it's around longer, we can make more of the protein. But let's say we get past that and we finally get to the ribosome. We are at what we call translational control. Oops, I went the wrong spot there. Translational control. There we go. And in translational control, we're going to talk about messenger RNA or transfer RNA being blocked from associating with the ribosome, therefore preventing translation from occurring, or possibly they may even help. So if we remember that the first stage of translation initiation, the messenger RNA binds to the small subunit of the ribosome. But what if a blocking molecule got there first and prevented it from binding? Then we would stop translation from occurring. That's translational control. But what if we do let the messenger RNA bind to the small subunit and the transfer RNA is supposed to come in? Maybe there's a molecule that might get there first and block that from happening. Again, we're preventing the initiation of translation. So translational control happens at the ribosome. But what if we get past that and we translate our messenger RNA into a protein? There's one last place where we can exert gene control or alter the output of this process and that's post-translational control. After we make our protein, we can modify it. We can cut it. We can add functional groups to it. We can link organic molecules or atoms to it. We can phosphorylate it or link it to other polypeptide chains as they take on their final form and therefore their function. This can occur with help from ribosomes in the ER, in the Golgi bodies, or just out in the cytoplasm. So in summary, in this overall process, getting from the DNA to our final output protein, there's a number of different places within this system where we can affect what the final outcome would be, and we can call that gene control, the day-to-day -day adjustment of the cellular pro production of a cell, or the, the protein production of a cell. So like I said, this is a cursory overview. We certainly aren't talking about any specific examples uh, except for the DNA methylation and acetylation, which was how we got to um, either the different types of cells, not just the changing of the moment-to-moment -moment output. And all of this was the nature of gene control in eukaryotic cells. Now, I thought that I would get in this video to the prokaryotic side of things, uh, the Opron model, but we're right at uh, 12 and a half minutes almost here, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this video and uh, come back for part two where we talk about gene control and prokaryotes, uh, spe specifically the Opron model.